Hello guys, um, so this is the beginning of lecture 4, as I said uh, from, from the start of this course, basically lectures 4 and 5 are the most, I don't know if they are the most interesting ones, but certainly they are the most fun ones, depending on, on the level of geekness, I would say that uh, you are, but anyway, so um, while we will do in these two lectures, basically we will start analyzing uh, communication protocols and we're going to give you know the design of certain protocols then we will try to attack them based on what we have said that Eve can do so we'll try to attack the protocols then go back redesign them attack them again find new flaws go back redesign them until we get them right right uh, now this lecture will be divided into two uh, videos the first videos the first video is about the basic notions of authentication and unfortunately it will be mostly um you know <laughs> there will be a lot of text so it, it it might be a bit boring but anyway it's necessary so that i build the ground for the next videos uh i, I promise that you will be compensated in the next uh video about that okay so uh a brief outline so we have already talked about cryptography about symmetric key encryption about asymmetric encryption uh, we gave the basic idea of cryptographic hash functions and then we moved on to digital signatures digital certificates and now basically we are going to start describing how security protocols work we're going to design several and see how several protocols basically uh, work and then we'll try to identify protocol flaws um, and find typical attacks then we will try to redesign our protocols in order to make them secure against those attacks and then we'll try to find new attacks and so on and so forth until basically we get a version of the protocol that it will be secure good so our goal today and tomorrow uh and tomorrow because basically this goal is the same for lectures four and five the next one so uh we will study various basic techniques for authentication uh basic mechanisms and protocol constructions for message and entity authentication so basically it's not when we authenticate something, we want sometimes to authenticate the entity, like the sender, for example, of the message, but as well as the message itself. Um, we're going to look on authentication key establishment techniques. So how Alice and Bob basically they can establish um, a key, right? Um, we're going to pay particular attention to mechanisms that have been standardized. Um, and we are also going to study protocols that can be used as building blocks. Now, um, we will also give some guidelines for designing what we call good protocols. And we will also study a wide range of protocol flaws. Um, to this end, we will list various known and typical attacking techniques. Um, we will demonstrate and analyze each attack. So basically on each attack, we will describe exactly what if uh, is trying to do and how she achieves basically to break the security of the um, underlying protocol um, and then we will become familiar with a common phenomenon which is that authentication protocols uh, are likely to contain flaws even when designed by experts so we will see a, a protocol that has been designed by two experts in, in, in crypto and communication security and for years no one could find any attack and then after some years you know someone realized that there is something wrong here and you know there was a big flaw um, good so a vulnerable environment uh, something that you we, we have seen already in lecture one about the threat models um, so a large network of computers such as the internet is typically open so which means that anyone which is a computer a device a person or uh, an organization basically uh, can join that network and start sending receiving messages without the need of an authorization right um, in such an open environment there may exist bad guys who will do all sort of bad things like if like if dropping altering messages forging messages rerouting deleting or even injecting um, fake messages so what we need to do is that we always have to have in our minds our active attacker which is Eve as well as what we want to achieve I hope you didn't forget our goal which is always to frustrate Eve and how do we frustrate Eve only by making sure that she that cannot access um, any information from the contents of our messages more or less okay this is not exactly true but yeah uh, now in such an environment eve can manipulate communications her manipulation techniques are um, unpredictable 
and she can may even represent the collision of bad guys, uh, which means that she can control a large number of network nodes which are geographically apart. And this can lead to attacks usually known as DOS denial of service attacks or DDoS attack. Like imagine that Eve basically controls um, thousands of, of computers around the world, and then you know she can um, plan uh, attack by simultaneously start sending messages to to a, to a server okay For, so the server suddenly starts receiving uh, millions of requests um, at the same time from all over the world and at the end the server you know is unable to uh, respond to, to or to process all these requests and thus Eve can achieve a denial of service attack anyway these kind of attacks um, are out of the scope of this course good so in anticipation of such a vulnerable environment, uh, Dolev and Yao um, proposed in 1981, they proposed the threat model that has become a standard, which is known uh, as the Dolev-Yao threat model or the malicious um, threat model. So what, what does the Dolev-Yao threat model says? Uh, first of all, that anyone uh, can join and start sending and receiving messages without the end of an authorization. So you, you have a protocol, um, anyone, like even Eve, can join and start, you know, and being part of the protocol. Eve is a legitimate user of the network and thus uh, she can initiate and participate in a conversation with any other user, which means that whenever Eve, for example, is communicating with Alice, Alice does not know that Eve is a malicious entity, right? So everyone in the network is seeing Eve as a legitimate user. No one can recognize Eve as a malicious entity. Right? So this is really important. In addition to that, Eve can become the receiver of all messages and Eve can send messages to anybody through impersonation. So, for example, Eve you know, may try to contact Alice by saying, Hi Eve, I'm Bob. Right? So she can try to impersonate Bob. We'll see some of, this, uh, of these techniques later. Uh, Apart from that, any message that is sent is considered to be available to Eve. So any message that is exchanged between Alice and Bob, we always consider that it's going through Eve. And any message that is received, again, is considered to have been through Eve. Uh, if you want to look at the uh, more details of the Dolev Yao threat model, uh, here is the paper that was published at SFCS in 1981. So the title was on the security of public key protocols. Um, now, in other words, what the Dolev Yao threat model says is that if we have our two friends, Alice and Bob, and they keep exchanging a bunch of information, um, if basically what she's doing is that she's having a full control of the network. So actually, if is considered to be the network that Alice and Bob are using to communicate, right? So we should always think of the open network as if. Good, so now that we, we describe what Eve can do, let's see what Eve cannot do. So Eve is not that all-powerful. All so Eve cannot guess a random number which is chosen from an arbitrarily large space. Uh, she cannot find the private key matching a public one. Uh, remember when we were describing ACML cryptography, we said that always the private key, the secret key of a user will... Uh, never leave his perimeter right so we always assume that the secret key will remain secret okay so a malicious guy will never be able to find uh, the secret key otherwise we have no security now without the correct key even can if cannot retrieve plain text from a given ciphertext um, and if cannot create valid ciphertext without the encryption key right um, this is mostly for symmetric encryptions, where we use the same key to both encrypt and decrypt messages. So we, we are saying that basically if Eve doesn't have access to the correct encryption key, um, she will not be able to generate valid ciphertext. Uh, apart from that, Eve cannot control private areas of the computing environment, such as, for example, accessing the memory of a party's computing device. So we, are, we actually assume um, physical security, because if we if, if we assume that Eve can access the memory of a user, of Alice's computer, for example, mm -hmm. then she can have access to all of the secrets that have 
that Alice has exchanged with Bob, right? Because everything is stored in the in the memory of of, of her machine. Uh, now, keep in mind that this uh, thread model, the Dolev Yao thread model, will apply to all of our protocols from now on. Okay, so in every protocol that we will start describing, we will assume that Eve is acting under the Dolev Yao thread model. Right, so a new level of abstraction. So till now, in the previous um, lectures, basically we talked about crypto systems, right? So we described how encryption and decryption works. We talked about uh, symmetric and asymmetric keys, about public and private keys. We talk about signatures, and then we, we talked about algorithms that they take as input a secret and they output um, an encrypted version of that secret, more or less. And then something about the signatures, which is, you know, the concept is more or less the same. Uh, now, on top of the crypto system, so we can use a crypto system uh, to build what we call authentication protocols. So, an authentication protocol um, is a type of computer communication protocols, uh, or anyway, also known as cryptographic protocol, uh, which is specifically designed for transfer of authentication data between two entities. Uh, now, an authentication protocol basically allows the receiving entity to authenticate the connecting entity. For example, Alice and Bob, or client connecting to a server, right? Alice connecting to Bob. So Alice is the client, Bob is the server, so Alice connecting to Bob. As well as authenticate itself to, to the connecting entity, which is like the server to the client, by declaring the type of information needed for authentication, as well as syntax. Uh, now, authentication protocols, um, I would say it is the most important layer of protection which is needed for secure communication within computer networks, right? Uh, so, so it's very important that we build secure and privacy-preserving uh, authentication protocols and integrity protecting protocols. Now, uh, in the authentication protocols, when we design authentication protocols, we assume that we have a perfect cryptography. And what does this mean? It means that a principal must possess a key K in order to use K to encrypt or decrypt the message or to obtain any information about the message encrypted with K, right? So if you don't have access to that key, then you cannot encrypt or decrypt a message properly or to obtain any information about a message that is encrypted with that secret key K. Um, similarly, a principal cannot change the contents of a message that is protected with a hash or it is signed with an unknown K. So again, we need to have access to that key K in order to change the contents of the message and try to fool um, one of the participating entities in our protocols. If we don't have access to that key, then basically we cannot do much. Good, so some authentication notations. Uh, so we may say that authentication is a procedure by which an entity establishes a claim property to another entity. For example, the former is someone who claims a legitimate use of some system or service, while the latter establishes the claim used through authentication. And usually we, we need mutual authentication, right? We will see when we describe TLS, for example, how we can have a kind of mutual authentication, right? When you want to log into your Gmail, for example, uh, how you authenticate to the, to the server, to the Gmail service, but also how the service is um, somehow authenticating to you. Now, the notion of authentication can be broken down in three categories. So, first of all, we've got the data origin authentication, the entity authentication, and the authenticated key establishment. So, let's see these categories in a bit more detail. So, data origin authentication involves basically identifying the source of a message. Um, and data integrity as a security service can be provided without source identification, right? So, keep in mind that data integrity is a different thing, right? It, does not have to do anything with data origin, right? So we can have data origin um, without data integrity, okay? Uh, now, data origin authentication involves establishing freshness of a message, which means that the receiver uh, should verify that the message was sent recent, recently, and if a message is fresh, uh, then lively correspondence is applied. This is very important to, to be able to, to know that a message is 
fresh, which means that it's not uh, a message that was generated and sent um, in the past from someone, right? So we need to know that this message was sent now, right? So it's not a replay of an old message. Now, data integrity does not require freshness. So a piece of stored data can have perfect, perfect integrity, which means that, again, we can check the integrity of a message, but this doesn't mean that we can um, have any any conclusion about its freshness, right? So these are two different things. So data integrity does not imply freshness. Good. Now, entity authentication is a protocol exchange by which a principal establishes a lively correspondence with the second principal whose claim identity is that sought by the first. Often the word entity is omitted, as in an important goal of authentication protocol is to establish lively correspondence of a principal. Now, <clears throat> often the claimed identity is just a protocol message, so confidence about the identity and the, liveless, uh, the liveliness can be achieved using data origin authentication techniques. Several entity authentication scenarios in distributed systems like client-server applications, logging to a computer, uh, conduct file transfer, mobile code running on a remote host, zero knowledge identification, and so on and so forth. And then we've got the authenticated key establishment, which is, I mean, which is the, the, the main thing that we will be focusing also in the next video, how we can establish um, an authenticated key. So key establishment is the process by which two parties, Alice and Bob, agree on a secret key as a means for building a secure communication channel between them. So Alice and Bob will have to run to exchange a bunch of messages uh, with main goal to generate and exchange a symmetric key that it will be used, uh, a secret key anyway, that it will be used to secure their future communication, right? So the, it will be used to encrypt all their future communication messages. Uh, that's what we mean by secure communication channel. Generally, uh, this is a subtask of entity authentication protocols for bootstrapping higher secure communications and key establishment material also forms important protocol messages which should be the subject for data origin authentication. Now, here is some notation. I mean, I'm not going to elaborate on that. Uh, it's pretty much uh, standardized, more or less. Anyway, you might find some differences in the um, literature. But anyway, um, you will see this also in the first coursework uh, at the top of the first page. So please try to use that notation and get familiar with it. Um, yeah, that's it. So thanks a lot. So in the next video, we'll start uh, looking at the protocols as I promised, and I hope you will find it really interesting. Thanks a lot.